Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. In the realm of municipal affairs, where governance intersects with the daily lives of citizens, the discussions of a new Cold War hold profound significance. Municipalities, often the front line of governance, are not immune to the far-reaching implications of global power struggles and technological advancements. So, today, we are delving into the intricate dynamics of a new Cold War, where the battleground extends far beyond the political ideologies to the very realm of technological innovation. In his latest work, Cold War 2.0, Canadian author George Takach delivers a thoughtful examination of how the rise of artificial intelligence is reshaping the age-old tensions between democracy and autocracy. Gone are the days when political powers are solely measured by the might of the military arsenal. Instead, we find ourselves amidst the landscape where the mastery of AI and other cutting-edge technologies dictates global dominance. Cold War 2.0 underscores the pivotal role these advancements play in shaping the contest between democracy and autocracy. As we confront the specter of autocracy, Cold War 2.0 serves as a beacon of insights, guiding us towards a future where de democratic principles triumph over authoritarian ambitions. So join us as we embark on a journey through the corridors of power, where the clash of ideologies converge with the march of technology. This is Municipal Affairs. George, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, Cold War 2.0, artificial intelligence and the new battle between China, Russia, and America. Uh, it is a page turner. It is a in-depth analysis on what the new Cold War, if we're already in it or if we are in the midst of it already, goes uh, sort of what we can expect. You delve into the intricate dynamics in this book of technological innovation, particularly, as I said in the title, artificial intelligence and its impact on the tensions between democratic and autocratic leaderships and political players around the world. Why is this an important subject in today's context? Well, you know, unless you've been living under a rock or somehow, uh, you know, put your head in the sand like an ostrich, it's pretty hard to ignore that there are a couple of autocracies now in the world, specifically uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia is, is one such autocrat, and Xi Jinping in, uh, in Beijing and China is the other autocrat. And unfortunately, uh, these two leaders uh, do not want to comply with the so-called rules-based international order. And we can get into that uh, if you wish as to what that entails. But the most egregious example, of course, is Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Both the annexation of Crimea, right, in 2014, and then the later full-on invasion in 2022. And then two areas that um, many of your listeners might not be as familiar with, but China, since about 2014, uh, has been super aggressive in claiming maritime rights in the South China Sea and causing, frankly, panic amongst all the other countries that border that very large uh, body of water. And then also Xi Jinping has said very publicly and very forcefully that he is going to make Taiwan a part of China and if they don't come voluntarily, he's going to do it militarily. And that would be a war uh, that, frankly, would surpass in intensity uh, even Ukraine. So for people who want to make sense of what those Cold War elements all add up to and how to make sense of it, but also to understand the technology that's going to be critical to that contest, but also giving a little bit of hope towards the end of the book, because I think it is a hopeful book at the end of the exercise. Um, that's why I wrote it, so that people could get a better handle on what's going on. And frankly, those of your listeners who are perhaps uh, a little bit older, they'll remember the first Cold War, 
And the good news there is the democracies prevailed. So um, if we do the right things, we, we can prevail again. So let's take a little history lesson here for a second, if you don't mind. And the first Cold War was between the Soviet Union and the United States. There were many players in that first Cold War, but those were the two major geopolitical forces in that Cold War. And there was no gray area around that Cold War. You were either for the democratic, the democracy side or the autocratic side. And it was pretty cut and dry. In today's, in your book, even in Cold War 2.0, there is a lot of gray area that a lot of people are dealing with. There's a lot of appeasement that's going on in today's world with G, uh, with Xi, with even Putin. How important is it to be all on one side while understanding that the Cold War of the 80s and the 70s and the 60s is not the Cold War of 2024, where it's all one side or the other and people just are going to believe the misinformation or the mistruths that are out there around what's going on in Ukraine or in China. Yeah, no, I think, Chris, you, you've really got a good sense of it. So there are similarities to what I now call Cold War I, um, but there are some very important differences. And one of them, to your point about people who in the world you know, might not want to sign up to one side or the other, um, there are actually a number of very important countries like India, like Brazil, like South Africa, who frankly are saying, look, I don't want to have to choose between the democracies or the autocracies. I want to do business with both. I want to have relationships with both. And I talk about that in the book in, in a separate chapter because you know, India is now the most populous country in the world, for example. So, so these are important countries. And that will be one theme that will be very, very interesting to watch. The other huge difference between Cold War I and the current Cold War is that <clears throat> except for the Soviet Union in starting in the mid-70s, selling oil and gas to Germany and, and other parts of Western Europe, there really wasn't a lot of economic integration between the two key protagonists. You know, the US didn't do a lot of trade with uh, the Soviets and vice versa, whereas China, who is now the principal protagonist for the autocrats, you know, has the second largest economy in the world. And Taiwan, Japan, um, you know, Brazil, a host of countries, China is their largest trading partner. So there's this hope that, oh, well, surely with all of this trade going on, uh, Xi Jinping will never attempt a military takeover of Taiwan. And a lot of people were starting to think that way. And then Putin did the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, which was also one of those unthinkables until it happened. So in many respects, it's a more complicated Cold War. And I'll just add one other piece uh, that is somewhat of a similarity between the two, which is the technology piece. So um, if you either think back to Cold War I, in my case, uh, I'm 66, so I, I have a little bit of history with the second half of it, or if you get my book, there's a little chapter on Cold War One. It, it's funny, my nephew, who's you know late twenties, said, "Gee, Uncle Uncle George, Cold War Two. Um, did I miss the memo? Uh, is was there a Cold War One?" And I said, "Well, funny you should ask. I I have a little short you know update on Cold War One so that people can get up the curve." But I believe, and and you've already mentioned it, that artificial intelligence is going to be the defining technology of the 21st century. You know, whether you're in government, whether you're in agriculture, whether you're in business, whether you're in law, finance, engineering, like you name it, artificial intelligence is gonna impact your world. And same for the military. Artificial intelligence is going to ripple through, and it's already rippling through all aspects of the military. 
So what's happening in Cold War II, and why I call it Cold War 2.0, is to really make the point that there's a technological dimension to this current conflict that's really, really important, is the Americans, but also now the Japanese, the Europeans, um, and the Canadians, we, we've all agreed that we will stop sharing our most advanced chip technologies, the so-called semiconductor chips, and certain types of AI, we will no longer be sharing those with the autocracies. Uh, the phrase is, Chris, you know, wh why would we give rope to the bad guys with which they can then hang us? So, so we've started that um, a couple of years ago, and that will be a fascinating part of this Cold War. Will China be able to make their own advanced semiconductor chips. My my own view is no, they won't. And we can go into that if, if you wish. Um, but in a funny way, I'll just end with this. If the gap, here's the gap, here's China, and, and then here's the democracies. If the gap starts to grow where the democracies have better and better technology and China continues flat, that might actually be one reason for Xi Jinping to say, you know what, I'm I'm going to try to take Taiwan sooner than later, because this gap is only growing, and I'm only going to get weaker relative to the democracies. So, you know, we're going to try to avoid that scenario as well through deterrence. But it's going to be a very, very finicky and tricky, you know, 10, 15 years ahead of us. So, okay, there's a few things that I want to dissect that you've just said. And I want to start by asking uh, sort of about Cold War One and now Cold, Cold War 2.0. Cold War One was fought against one entity, the Soviet Union. Cold War 2.0 is now going to be fought against two, and it's being fought on two different fronts, China and Russia. And they seem to be in collaboration. They seem to be friendly with each other. They, they want what they want the status quo for them and they're comfortable with that does this bring up a new challenge that we haven't thought of when we have now two fronts that we're potentially fighting a cold war on instead of just one with soviet union back in the 80s yes it it makes for a more complicated environment frankly um because For instance, uh, nuclear weapons. You're absolutely right. In Cold War I, it was largely uh, a situation where, you know, the Americans had the nuclear bomb first, the atomic bomb. And then, uh, you know, frankly, the Russians stole the plans from the Americans, so they built their own. Um, and then the two of them, after the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, where, where things really, really got very, very close to a, to a full-on war, um, the two of them got together and they started to agree some arms control treaties. It's very interesting right now, Chris, because China is building its nuclear capability very quickly and very massively. And so now, you know, the United States needs to sit down with both Russia and China. And, and how's that going to work? You know, it's a much more complicated negotiation. If you've ever been, frankly, in any negotiation, buying a car, a house, whatever it is, as soon as there's three parties, it, it gets just way more complicated. So that's going to be uh, a very difficult scenario. Now, the other piece that we're starting to see uh, for sure in the Middle East is Iran is getting into the mix, helping Russia with, with the drone technologies and, and, and weapons. And even North Korea is starting to get into the mix. So you start to see this, this alignment. Now, the good news is on the side of the democracies, you know, the United Kingdom, it, it isn't what it used to be in terms of a world power, but it's still important. And it does have some nuclear weapons. France still has some nuclear weapons. And if you think of all the European Union and, and especially NATO, um, you know, that alliance is very, very important. 
it's kind of been a little bit, um, you know, lackadaisical over the last 30 years when, you know, the first Cold War ended, people said, oh, well, you know, we're done. And people started taking a peace dividend and they stopped spending so much money on, on, on military matters. That's now got to change. And so Europe's got to come around. And the other thing that is very, very important to the democracies is Japan, South Korea, Australia, the Philippines. These are all democracies that are getting much, much closer to one another and to the United States. So when it comes to alliances, we in the democracies actually do alliances better than the autocracies. So that's a very hopeful message. If we can keep our uh, alliances uh, you know, strong, that will be you know, a great benefit to have for, for the democracies. So the main theme about this, uh, the book, Cold War 2.0, Artificial Intelligence and the New Battle Between China, Russia, and America, is artificial intelligence. And a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, you probably would not have been able to tell, ask anyone what AI was going to be like in 2024. During the height of COVID-19, AI just wasn't on in the lexicon of society. It may have been in the lexicon of some people, but the average resident or average Canadian, average uh, uh, person of the world probably didn't really understand what AI was going to be like in 2024. How do you see AI changing modern geopolitical mm -hmm. relations in the context of to use your analogy, we don't want to give the rope to someone who could potentially hang us? So right at the top of the discussion, you said it was a page turner. And I think specifically what you might be referring to in my book is in the introduction, I open with a scenario where China, its patience has run out and it wants to take Taiwan militarily. And in that case, there are many different scenarios for what that military exercise would look like but in the case that i use they start by launching literally thousands of missiles and drones against taiwan and it's not you know a completely fictional account in the sense that if you look at what's gone on in ukraine um in many respects it's become a drone and missile war so imagine though your, well, and also what Iran did several weeks ago when they launched 350 combinations of, of drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles, you know, against, um, against Israel. So to launch, for China to launch two, 3,000 at one time is, is not a huge stretch. And at that point, imagine that you're in Taiwan or you're on a naval vessel um, that's either Taiwanese or American floating around Taiwan, and all of a sudden your computer screen lights up like a Christmas tree with these thousands of Chinese missiles coming at Taiwan. And as opposed to Iran, which, you know, it took 12 hours for their drones to get to Israel. It took three hours for the cruise missiles to get to Israel. In the case of China and Taiwan, it's only 100 miles across that strait of Taiwan. And the so-called kill zone, if I can use that phrase, where you want to hit those missiles if you're on defense is in the middle of the strait of Taiwan so that the debris and everything falls into the water and not on your country. So basically, you've got five minutes to take those thousands of blips, all those individual missiles and projectiles and cruise missiles and drones, and assign your interceptor missiles to counter them. And what I argue in the book is that humans simply, you know, with the best of intentions and the greatest training, they just can't do it. It's an overwhelming task. It's a perfect task though, for artificial intelligence. Is the it artificial can, intelligence? Can, can, can I play the little devil's advocate with you here, George, for a second? Sure. Is it the perfect, is artificial intelligence the 
end all be all because there's always the human factor in any military situation. I don't care. No matter what situation you're in, there's always a human factor because who knows? Computers screw up. Humans screw up as well. Do you, do we do do democratic societies, do democratic power players want to trust fully the artificial intelligence of the world? Well, okay, there's a lot in that <laughs> statement. We, we could have a, a separate two-hour discussion just on that. Where you're absolutely right, and I'm with you 100%, is when a country is contemplating sort of, <clears throat> let's call it offensive action. You know, when, when a country says, okay, I'm going to launch an attack against someone else, in my view, there should always be what we call a human in the loop. We, yeah. we should never abdicate or delegate or defer that decision to a machine. You know, that should always be a real individual person with responsibility and accountability. But what I'm talking about in terms of the AI in my scenario, just to go back to it, is defensively, so, you know, they, they're starting the war, you know, they're, they're the bad guys, we're the good guys, but we have to defend ourselves and we have to try to shoot as many of these attacking missiles out of the sky. That's where AI is really, really good, assuming the computers work, you're absolutely right, um, because they can actually pick up the two or 3,000 missiles immediately on launch, they can track them, and the computer can assign the defensive missiles, the so-called interceptors, in a way that would simply overwhelm, you know, individual technology operators or, you know, the people who run the, the, <clears throat> the radar and, and so forth. So, in, and, and by the way, we're also using it with cyber defense. So again, when unfortunately Russia and China and Iran and North Korea launched cyber attacks against the democracies, increasingly it's artificial intelligence that's picking up that, oh, they've attacked a company in Calgary. So as soon as they detect something in Saskatoon, the computers talk to each other and say, oh, it's the same virus that's that's hit Calgary, so this is what you need to do. And, so, and they can do it in a very, very efficient and quick manner. Now, it becomes a bit of cat and mouse, of course, right? As, as we improve defense, they're going to improve the offense. And eventually, um, there is a scenario where it's our AI against their AI. But... Assuming the democracies are primarily defensive in nature, like NATO is a defensive alliance, I think AI holds the promise of a very powerful deterrence. Unfortunately, Ukraine wasn't in NATO, and so you know they weren't under the big umbrella of protection. But with NATO, if we can get the AI defense you know, really, really organized properly and fine-tuned, then I would think that uh, Putin would, you know, he, he's already thinking twice about ever attacking NATO because we're pretty strong, but it almost becomes like a little mini nuclear weapon, if you catch my analogy, where you just can't beat the AI defensively. But I'm with you 100% that the so-called killer drones, you know, that are, are, are launched and they hover above, um, you know, your house in Calgary and they, and they wait to see if, if Chris comes out and then, you know, does facial recognition and, and shoots, uh, you know, like that sort of stuff. Um, you know, we, yeah, we should not see the light of day. And the good news there, and I'll end with this, is just yesterday, so on Tuesday of this week, the, for the first time, um, the Chinese military and, and sort of diplomats and their counterparts in the U.S., they met in Geneva to start a discussion around, you know, what rules could be cobbled together on AI. And for instance, you know, no AI should ever start a nuclear war without human input like that's 
that's such an easy rule that that'll be a that'll be a quick one to agree to but so so we all agree that ai has the capacity for for real harm and we have to guard against that but you know chris there's there's no putting ai you know back in the bottle uh, the, the genie is out and its potential is is really really powerfully positive but like all technologies it can be used you know for good or ill but yes we have to guard against the downside as well the first i would say the first kickoff to the first cold war was the race for the nuclear bomb we've seen mm -hmm. it play out in national stages and we talked a little bit beforehand and i want to loop back to the original statement but uh cold war 2.0 is going to be fought in sort of the artificial intelligence world and the precursor to that will be the sort of semiconductor which we talked about and who will have the quickest access to more semiconductors and you say in this book and even in, in our interview so far that china will be far behind that potential of creating sufficient semiconductors why do you assert that because and i'm not i'm not trying to diminish our capabilities here in the western countries and even in the democratic societies but we seem to always be relying on China for advancements in technology. Well, it, it's interesting. The, the previous history of the last, you know, call it 150 years, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, in, in the 1880s, when, when Britain ruled the seas, right, ruled Britannia, they came out with the so-called dreadnought battleship. This was the biggest, meanest ship ever built. But fairly quickly, the Americans and the Japanese built ships and the Germans built ships that were pretty close because, you know, the Germans had the steel making capability and so on. After World War II, the Americans built, or during World War during World War II, they built the first atomic bomb. And you, you know, you and many of your listeners will have seen the movie Oppenheimer, which is the history of that. And then fairly quickly, the Russians stole the plans, and there's allusion to that in in Oppenheimer as well. And so they had the you know the atomic bomb as well fairly quickly. What's fascinating about semiconductor chips, the most advanced ones, the ones that they're the size of your little fingernail, but they hold a hundred billion transistors. You know, just let that sink in. A hundred billion little switches on that little fingernail. It's really, it's an astounding concept. And here's the thing. 92% of these advanced ones are made in Taiwan. So if, if some of your listeners are wondering, you know, why is he talking so much about Taiwan? In one sense, it's because if Taiwan goes under and these huge factories that make these chips, if they get blown up or if they're not producing anymore, like the entire economy in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, like worldwide, comes to a grinding halt because these chips they're not just in your computer and your smartphone they're in your kitchen you're right they're in your stove they're in your microwave they're in your car a car is just a computer now on four wheels but here's the thing chris making these chips is so difficult you need these big factories that they have in taiwan but more importantly you need a machine that makes the chips. These machines are then put into these factories in Taiwan. And the company that makes these machines is actually not in the United States. They're not in Japan. They're in little Holland in, in the Netherlands. But it's not just the Dutch. This machine, which by the way, one machine costs $500 million. It's a cool, cool $500 million for one machine. It has two components. I'm just going to mention one of them because it will, well, it's it blows my mind every time I talk about it. So it might blow your mind. There is a laser in this Dutch machine that pulsates and hits a little bit of tin 
and liquefies it into a droplet. And then it quickly pulses again and it vaporizes the droplet. And then that sort of, the, the, um, the vapor settles onto the silicon chip and that's how they start etching the, you know, where the 100 billion transistors goes. But get this, this double pulse happens 50,000 times a second. Like, again, it, it is mind blowing. And it took the Dutch a company called ASML and its partners in Japan, in Taiwan, in the United States, in Germany. It took them 20 years to come up with this technology. And frankly, the Chinese are not anywhere close to making one of these machines. And without this machine, they're in real trouble. So last November, when Xi Jinping and Biden met in San Francisco, the first topic the Chinese wanted to talk about was Taiwan, which we've already covered. The second topic was, you're really, really hurting us with your chip embargo and the embargo on these machines. So this scenario that we have today is going to be very different from the atom bomb or the dreadnought battleship because the Chinese know everything about these machines. They, they, they've had earlier versions of them. They reverse engineer them. They, they actually see all the parts. But it is really hard to make it all happen. So is it a five-year lead? Is it a six-year lead? It's, it's, it's that kind of a lead that the democracies have. And the Americans, uh, the Biden administration, but it started with the, the Trump administration as well, they are taking advantage of this technological, really advanced that they have. And what I would say um, to, to our American friends, because this is one of the reasons I wrote the book, is I'm very nervous about the isolationist tendency that I'm seeing in certain circles in the US, particularly in the Republican Party, is that just this chip technology that I've been describing, the Americans cannot do it themselves. They need the Taiwanese, they need the Japanese, there's other components, they need the Europeans. So anybody in the US who thinks, oh, you know, we don't need Europe, we don't need Asia, we can just put up big walls, you know, up on the West Coast and the East Coast and, and we're good, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. And the way the world economy works now is all the democracies need to pull together. And if we pull together, we'll be okay. But if a major country like the US starts thinking it can go off and do it on its own, um, we're all gonna be in a much more difficult position. So, you mentioned the elephant in the room, so I'm going to play in the sandbox for a few seconds, if you don't mind. And let's talk about Trump. There's an election coming up in November. The entire world is watching this election with bated breath. China, Russia particularly, are, is watching what's going on in this election with bated breath. Are you concerned that we could be in Cold, Cold War 2.1 after November 7th, uh, because of a new president in office in the United States or January, uh, whatever day they get sworn, I think it's the 23rd this year. Uh, do you th is there a concern that this book may be out of date by the time a new president gets in because how Donald Trump views the world and how Joe Biden views the world are two different worldviews. And we talk about that new world order and that new world order differs depending on who's the president in 2025. So I'm 66 years old. I, I know <laughs> I look a lot younger, but uh, believe it, I'm, I'm 66. I'm turning 67 in August. And I say unreservedly that this upcoming American election, which it looks like it'll be between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, is by a country mile, the most consequential US presidential election in my lifetime. Because 
and I think you you've nailed the big themes. We know pretty much what a Joe Biden second term would look like. He has been superb in rebuilding alliances, especially in the Pacific. His relationship with Japan is super strong. Biden has helped Japan and South Korea mend their differences. By the way, I'm in love with South Korea. They've done for military equipment, like tanks and armored personnel carriers and artillery, they've done for those items what they did in the car industry with Kia and Hyundai. Yes, they're not Mercedes or BMW, but they do 80% of what those fancy cars do, and they cost, you know, 40%. So take Poland, just as an, as an aside. They're spending $40 billion on military equipment this year, and half of it, 50%, is being made in South Korea. I mean, again, just to show you how interdependent, you know, the democracies have become. So Biden's doing a fantastic job in, in knitting together alliances, both in the Pacific and in Europe. And with Donald Trump, you know, there's just a big question mark. And it's the unpredictability that is so disconcerting because maybe somebody does, if he gets elected, maybe somebody does convince him that, you know, we can't let Taiwan go because our chips will stop coming into the U.S. and American car companies, you know, will shut down and every other company will shut down and so on. So it's just with, with Trump, we just don't know. And one of the reasons I wrote the book and one of the reasons I went with an American publisher is, you know, I want to get the book into as many American hands as possible, particularly independent voters, people who are undecided, because this is a really, really consequential election because you're absolutely right. Xi Jinping is waiting to see what happens on November the 5th. Um, Putin is absolutely waiting to see, you know, there's no, there's not going to be any negotiations, serious or otherwise go on for, for the Ukraine war until Putin knows whether it's Trump or Biden. And I just hope that if Trump, if he gets in, I just hope someone gives him a copy of my book and convinces him that we need to listen to what Dwight Eisenhower said, a Republican president, right, in the 1950s, none of us is as strong as all of us. And that's a very foreign concept for Donald Trump. But if he can learn that, maybe he can still turn it around. But it does make me very, very nervous at this point. So I have one last segment I want to talk about. Do you have an extra 10 minutes to give me? Sure. Or yeah, no, no, no. Okay, perfect. And I, I want to talk about the role that the United Nations, the great mm. beacon of, of the 1940s that was brought to fruition by some great minds after, world, after some world wars. And the one entity that you talk about in this book that you says needs reform is the United Nations Security Council. Um, in your opinion while researching this uh how do you assess the current effectiveness of the security council in today's geopolitical world so just a little bit of background perhaps for some of your listeners who may not be up the curve on on the united nations again you 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 nailed you nailed it in terms of coming out of the second world war the United Nations was created and viewed by you know millions and millions of people around the world as a really important institution to help prevent another world war because you know that war 70 million people died which in today's population terms is closer to like 4 or 500 million can imagine 500 million people dying in a war today so they created the United Nations. It has the General Assembly where all the countries are members and they, 
they sit in that big hall that you you see on the the news reports but there's also a so-called security council and there's 15 members 10 members are elected for two year terms but there are five permanent members so there's the united states france and britain china and russia and what happened in 1945 as they were negotiating this new institution is the big five as as they were called they all required that they have a veto at the security council so when a resolution comes up for action it's not you know majority governs it's well you need a majority but if just one of those five says no i don't like the resolution then it doesn't pass so to your question how was the system working um I'm going to take you back to 1990, 1991, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. You may recall, um, again, an unjustified invasion. The Security Council meets and it votes to condemn the, the invasion and it authorizes a military force to be created to kick him out. And there was no veto of that resolution. And that's exactly what happened. Now, the United States led the effort, but there were, I think, 30 other countries, um, and they pushed Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And so that's like that's a classic example of how it should work. What happened, though, in February of 2022, when Russia invades Ukraine, again, unjustified, illegal, against the rules-based international order, you name it, the Security Council meets and everybody's up in arms, but Russia vetoes any action against itself. And that's where I bet many of your listeners were just like throwing their arms up saying, well, what's the use of the UN? if one of the big five can always, you know, get out of jail free and have no consequences. So in the book, I propose uh, a, a revision to the Security Council where it's still 15 members, but there's no veto for any power or for any country. But there's also private voting, what I call private voting. So when they cast their votes for or against the resolution, you actually don't know who voted for or against. All you know at the end of the exercise, did the resolution pass or did it not pass? And the reason for that is when in the corporate world, which I was a lawyer for 35 odd years, when you have these private votes at the board of directors or in senior management team meetings, people are much more honest because often, you know, the way the chair votes is the way everybody else is going to vote. Or if you know that Russia is voting a certain way and you're a little country in Africa or Asia and you feel obliged to vote the way Russia is voting. So you, you get non-optimal results if everybody knows what you know the vote is in terms of who voted how so it's a bit of a stretch in terms of a proposal but you know uh, a number of countries like india like indonesia like germany are starting to really make some noise about we need to reform the security council so i thought i'd put you know my proposal in there and and let's let's see what happens do you think the Security Council is useful in 2024 from when it was first initiated? Well, it's it's sort of like what Churchill said about capitalism. It's it's the worst <laughs> system in the world, except for every other one. So it, it's not perfect. And listen, if if you look into the history, and you were absolutely right early um, a few minutes ago when I was researching the book. I went back to the 
to the early debates around the United Nations. And everyone knew that this veto was going to be a problem, right? So it's not like, oh, it was a big surprise. But a number of countries said, look, if I don't have the veto among the big five, you know, I'm not joining. And if you look at the precursor to the United Nations, as it were, the League of Nations that came out of the First World War that really did not have a good track record in preventing the Second World War, it's still better than nothing. But again, I think there's enough disillusionment courtesy of the invasion of Ukraine where we might just be in a position to say, look, we, we've got to make a fairly significant reform. Because if you also then remember back to March of 2022, when the Security Council was unable to get Russia to vote against itself, of course, they voted at the General Assembly and 132 countries voted on a resolution that was you know, absolutely slamming Russia. So 132 out of 200, it's, again, I would have liked a higher number, but 132 kind of tells you where the world opinion was. Um, but unfortunately, there is no, you know, strong police presence in the international sphere the way there is domestically. Um, but the UN is the best that we've got. So we've, we've got to work with it. But ideally, we'd be able to reform it. Um, I, we're about 45 minutes in, and I want to ask one last question before I do wrap up. And you're a Canadian. Sure. I'm a Canadian. You talk about the major geopolitical players in this book, America, China, and Russia. What role does Canada have in playing in the next or in the current Cold War 2.0? So as a Canadian, I believe actually quite strongly that Canada should participate actively and vigorously in these big geopolitical trends for a couple of reasons. One, you know, we do have a large economy, right? We're in the G7, which is the biggest of the democracies. So we have a fairly, you know, 10th or 11th in the world size democracy. We're now, you know, 40 million people. It's not huge in the scheme of things, but it's it's a good sized country. And unfortunately, I think we're sort of not playing up to our potential, to, to be perfectly frank. And, and one of the reasons why is because on matters relating to the military, uh, for about, well, since the end of the first Cold War, so the, the late 1980s, early 1990s, um, you know, we've really downplayed the importance of the military. We, we've done some things recently that, that are not bad. We're rebuilding our Navy, uh, but those new ships, you know, they don't show up for another 10, 15 years. And we've got some very old ones uh, creaking along right now. Um, we, we've bought some new fighter aircraft, the F-35, but again, they're not due to be delivered for, for a number of years. Um, it's all about drones, though, as, as I'm sure you're picking up on it. And... Chris, I'm actually pretty certain that the last Canadian fighter pilot has probably been born. Um, she she might only be a toddler at this point, but um, you know the world is moving to drone technology, and and we're we're not again very active in in drone technology. So we have to do more. It's a question of money, and it's a question of priority. Our military is about 15,000, 16,000 people short of where it needs to be to be at sort of 68, 70,000 people. And, you know, that's a huge deficiency. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, a couple of years ago, the government, in its wisdom, this was a good move, said, well, maybe we should uh, open up enrollment in the Canadian military to permanent residents, rather than just, you know, you have to be a citizen. 
And that was a great idea. And 22,000 permanent residents applied, which was superb. But our processes for doing the security checks, which take 18 to 24 months, those didn't change. And so imagine, you know, you apply to the military and they tell you, oh, well, we'll let you know in, you know, two years. Well, you're not going to put your life on hold for two years. So there's insufficient urgency in the current government on these issues. And that's unfortunate. And, I'm, and, and I actually worry that particularly if, if Trump is elected in November, uh, that he might turn his gaze northward and say to Ottawa, look, you're not holding up, you know, your fair share on, on the military. And you know what? I'm canceling out of the free trade agreement. And that would be devastating, especially in, in Ontario and Quebec. And he might actually cancel NORAD. I mean, like all sorts of bad things might happen. And then Canada is looking pretty alone in the world, right? I mean, we're still a member of NATO. But um, so I would hope that in the next election in Canada, that people take this issue much more seriously and that hopefully, you know, you would do a few more podcasts with other members and, and like, like members of parliament and so on and, and really press them and say, look, I think most Canadians get it. They look at Ukraine, they look at what's going on there, uh, or they look at the Middle East, they look at Taiwan and they say, you know, security really, really does need to be, you know, moved up the priority list. Um, and right now, it's unfortunately lagging, I think, far behind. George, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me and talk about your book, Cold War 2.0, Artificial Intelligence and the New Battle Between China, Russia, and America. For those who are listening and even watching, George will be in Alberta next month on June 14th, 2024, for an author's talk at Audrey's Book in Edmonton, Alberta from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, tickets are free. You just have to register. The link is in the show notes, so I I highly recommend you check it out. I'm assuming books will be available to pick up as well if he if, if they if he's going to be bringing some or if Audrey's books will have them. So I highly recommend you come out to Audrey's book on June 14th from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time to hear George talk and continue this great discussion. George, thank you so much for doing this. Well, actually, Chris, if I can make a, a pitch beyond the Edmonton session, which I'm looking forward to, to seeing a bunch of your listeners at that one. But I'm being hosted by the so-called Canadian International Council, the CIC. And if people go onto their website, because I'm also in Saskatoon that week, I'm in Calgary, I'm in Prince George, and I'm in Whitehorse. It's very similar to, you know, the Taylor Swift tour. It's It's... It's a little bit smaller in, in size, but the idea is to, to go out and, and have some really good discussions with folks um, in Western Canada on this issue, because um, again, I think, you know, all Canadians need to be engaged on this. Well, So go yeah. on cic.ca website and you'll see the dates and the places for the other sessions. Yeah. And for those who are listening and watching, as always, the link is that to the, the CIC website is in the show notes as well. So check it out. Um, now that I know that you're in Calgary, I will be there. I'll be at your show in Calgary to make sure I pick up an actual copy and shake your hand. So thank you so much for doing this, George. Greatly appreciated. It. It's always a pleasure to sit down and talk about books and how the world is changing in this ever crazy world that we live in. So thank you so much. Perfect. See you in Calgary. Cheers. But as always, stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs like you saw today to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. 
Find the support page link on the Cross-Border Interviews website today. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.